We're here with Justin Francis, co-founder of Responsible Travel, a company that has dedicated itself almost entirely to promoting sustainable tourism since 2001. Inspired by that, I don't think there was any way we could not get the train down. And I think, indeed, that's what your website suggests visitors do. So on that point, we wanted to start with what can people do besides consider their mode of transport to travel responsibly? Well, let's start with carbon, the big one. So mode of transport, we've got that out of the way. Two other things are really, really important. The first, surprisingly, is the food you eat when you're on a holiday. And the second is the accommodation you stay in and its energy use. The food you eat, we've just completed some research which will show, can be the biggest contributor of carbon of your entire holiday. Even sometimes including the train travel, and depending on the holiday, even more than the flight in some cases. Why is that? Well, food, particularly meat and dairy, is incredibly carbon intensive to produce. And secondly, it can be transported, accruing additional carbon miles attached to it. And lastly, we tend to waste nearly half of it. So food, think about the food you eat. Think local, think plant-based, and think about staying in places which use renewable energy for the heating and for the energy and for the kitchens. It's quite good actually because we, we did a shot with the uh, Eat Vegan sign. I don't know if you know yes. it. Like just okay. <laughs> just yes. we'll have that as B-roll. Yes. Is the solution to all of our problems carbon offsetting? No. That's the solution to none of our problems. And let me tell you why. We've got to change behaviours. We've got to stop putting so much carbon into the atmosphere in the first place. Carbon offset can't be a distraction from that. And I fear it is a distraction from that. So we need to get to the real issue, which is reducing the amount of carbon that we put into the atmosphere. There's one other minor detail with carbon offsets is that most of them don't work. EU research last year looked at the gold standard carbon offsets, found that 85% of them don't deliver the carbon reductions which are promised. So it's a distraction and it doesn't work and it's creating all the wrong type of behaviours. Gives you carte blanche, doesn't it, to continue what you were doing, yeah. act in the same way and absolve your guilt. Yes, you know, and you know, the whole thing about taking responsibility, about responsible tourism, is to take, is to genuinely take responsibility for your impacts, not to pass them off on somebody else somewhere somewhere else in the world, you know, in the hope that they might reduce their emissions. It's effectively like paying someone else to diet for you. I can't be bothered to diet. I don't want to change what I eat, um, so I'm going to pay someone else to do it elsewhere. It's not the kind of behaviour which we need. And there's some, also some really worrying signs. Um, just this week, I looked at the uh, research and development budgets of Airbus um, and Boeing, two of the big manufacturers. It's decreasing. You would have thought at this time we would see increased investment in research and develop in renewable aviation. Why aren't we? Well, I put it to you that one of the reasons is, is that it's much easier to buy very cheap carbon offsets than it is to do the really hard work in investing long term um, in renewable aviation. If you have to fly though, mm. and, you, and, and you've got a choice between an airline that offsets its flights or actually has a young fleet, what's the best choice? Well, always think reduction first. Always comes first. So if you have a, an airline with a younger fleet with, that's going to pollute less, that's the one to choose from. Choose. If you can choose a flight which is direct, uh, point to point, rather than one which stops off, choose that. Why? Because the takeoff and landing contributes quite a significant part of the carbon emissions. So fly direct, fly in uh, economy class because we can get more people in the plane that way. Pack light, um, think of those things, not offsetting. Do you ever fly out of interest? I do fly, yeah. And I'm, you know, why do I fly? Um, because um, the science tells us not that we need to continue as we're doing now, that's a disaster. But the science doesn't tell us that we need to eliminate flying altogether. Uh, I fly, I fly less than I used to. I tend to stay longer uh, when I fly, because uh, I enjoy it more. But it also means less flights. Uh, I knock out some of the short breaks. Um, and so I'll be going to Norfolk um, uh, in, in the UK um, for, 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 for Christmas. Um, so I've almost returned to the way I used to travel when I was a lot longer. Fewer holidays with flights, stay longer, less short breaks with flights, more train travel, 
more domestic terrorism. I think I saw a phrase actually reminded me. We're going back to the future. Yeah, we are. I mean, there's so many ways, David, we're going back to the future. You know, if you think about how we used to produce food, many people are now advocating that's actually a much more sustainable way to do it. I think we need to go back to the future in our holiday choices and holiday patterns. I also think it's a better, I'm quite stressed out by, you know, by lots of travel, lots of short breaks. You know, I live a hectic life, most people do, bombarded with more information than ever before. I enjoy staying a little bit longer. Fewer, but longer holidays with flights. And I think on that point, it's a good segue into uh, time. A lot of people want to travel sustainably. They want to, say, take the train, for example, but time is a big inhibitor. Mm. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Climate Perks, the possible, the, the, the charity used to be called 1010 Launched. Mm. Um, big fan. I think it's, it's, it's necessary, and I hope many companies jump on board with that. I'd like to get your thoughts on that as, as, a, as a concept, but also... What, what else do you think governments or, or companies can do to incentivize more sustainable travel among their staff? Yeah, well, let me start by saying that I think that um, targeting action based on, on our behavior on customers is important. We all need to do our bit. I don't think that's going to get us to the ultimate solution of what we need. There's a few willing people who will change their behaviors. Um, that's not sufficient to achieve the dramatic reduction we, do, we need. We do need governments. We need governments to do two things. Limit demand for aviation over the next 20 to 30 years, because we will not have electric, hybrid, renewable aviation over the next 20 to 30 years. Limit demand. The second thing they need to do is pump a huge amount of money into, into the development of renewable powered aviation. So I, I, you know, I'm wary about guilt tripping individual people, individual customers, uh, at the expense of focusing where the real tar target needs to be, which is government. However, uh, Climate Perks, great idea. You know, something simple and positive that a business can do for their staff, to mean that they can travel by train, just give them a little bit of extra holiday so that they can uh, enjoy the same amount of time in the destination. Yeah, it's a win-win because then your, your, employer, your employees will be happier as well. And then, you know, it's a nice feedback loop. It is, yeah. It does require businesses to accept that their, uh, their staff are going to take more holiday in total. But it's good PR. You can, you know, you can push that out and say, look, here's, here's, you know, we're trying. It's, it's about the social element as well, not just the environmental, even though both of those are being uh, helped you know, in, that, in, that, in that scheme. Um, so about kind of the government's role, we're obviously we're speaking just before Election Day. Um, whoever wins, what should the new government's first priority be on the environment? In relation to tourism, um, it should be building no new airports. Um, we cannot expand aviation over the next 20 years. Uh, it should be a fair taxation on aviation. It should be limiting demand um, and it should be creating a mechanism for massive funding in R&D on uh, electric aviation. You'll have seen a couple of parties advocate the frequent flyer levy. And the reason for that is the shocking statistics on a very small number of people who are taking an enormous proportion of the flights. So the frequent flyer levy is designed to tackle, to tackle that. It'd be very hard to implement, um, but I support the sort of social justice dimension of that, of that policy. Yeah, I, I've actually been, you know, I, I agree with that. And I was, you know, my next question is about air miles. And, and it's sort of in that same um, wheelhouse, you might say. Do you think air miles might be replaced by railway miles? Well, I think, I mean, I think air miles should be eliminated, air mile schemes. I mean, th this, is a, this is an incentive to frequent flyers to fly more. You know, we do not need frequent flyers to fly more. So, so that, that has got to go. We've also got to level out the playing field between rail and, and aviation. I mean, not just in terms of time, which you've touched on, but in terms of cost. You know, just think about this. How can we have train travel being more expensive than aviation? I see the price of planes and flights increasing more than I see the price of trains coming down. And, and for that reason, I believe that, that a large section of people might actually be priced out of the sky. What do you think, are there, are there any ethical questions to answer there where you're, you're sort of saying, actually, no, flying's not for you, it's just for the few. What would you say to that? 
Well, I think that's a perfectly le legitimate question you know, to ask. If we're increasing the price of aviation, uh, are we just pricing out um, families of four on, on, on a modest, modest income? The, the two things I would say to that is one that many of the schemes, such as the frequent flyer levy, are not targeted at the person taking their one family holiday of the year. They're targeted at the person taking 20 or 30 or 40 trips a year. But let's take the kind of moral question, you know, should we be most concerned about the family of four that shouldn't, that, that can't fly because flying's got more expensive? Or should we be concerned about the entire community in Bangladesh? who is underwater and cannot live, cannot sustain their lives at all. So when asking about social justice, who am I most concerned about? Us of us, you know, those of us in the UK or the West or in Europe or America who may need to, um, to fly a little bit less or face the cost of higher aviation, or communities who are going to have no lives whatsoever. I make no apology. I am more concerned about those people who are going to have no lives whatsoever. And if that creates some pain for us, as long as it's fairly distributed, yes, we, sh we should face a little bit of pain for that. And just to kind of play devil's advocate a little bit here, some people simply just want to fly and flop on a package holiday to the Med. Mm. What do you say to them and how can sustainable or responsible travel reach the mass market? Well, this is, this is another interesting conversation. Um, in, the, in the past, the all-inclusive holiday where you stay basically within the compound, has been thought of as the, the least sustainable tourism um, possible. But let's just think about that a little bit, little bit differently. Now, what an all-inclusive could do um, is reduce the pressure on places where residents are complaining because of the impacts of tourism. There's no reason that an all-inclusive couldn't use the greenest energy sources on the planet. There's no reason that an all-inclusive can't be supporting local micro farmers and local farm schemes to generate its, uh, to create its produce and its food. There's no reason why an all-inclusive need not employ and train local people from the community. There's no reason why an all-inclusive couldn't in fact run a couple of excursions to local community or conservation projects. So I don't, I don't buy the argument that um, there is mainstream tourism and there's, then there's niche responsible tourism. I think parts of the mainstream tourism industry, if done with a more sustainable mindset, can be very important. They can be very efficient in terms of, of carbon and energy. They can be very useful in terms of um, reducing the pressure on honey spots. And most important, they can also give families without a big income, you know, a really cost-effective holiday. So redesign mainstream tourism, redesign the all-inclusive. What are the main things that people ask for? What, what are the main inquiries of responsible travel from the wider public? Um, well, tourism goes through phases where we all fall in love with a particular destination. And I think Instagram increasingly is part of, part of that. Um, and it creates um, a sort of cycle of something that's all the rage and then, and then it kind of gets, because of the way tourism is, it often gets tarnished and, and then no one wants to go anymore. I mean, the great irony of tourism is we all want to go where the tourists aren't going. So uh, we've been through stages of Kilimanjaro, everyone wants to go to Kilimanjaro, and we saw a few celebrities. Kilimanjaro is all the rage. Cuba. You know, before the Americans come, get, get to Cuba before it's before it's, before it's spoiled. Um, but right now, Croatia um, is probably our best-selling destination. The coasts, uh, small ship, um, small boat, and um, trips um, ar around the coastline of Croatia. We were going to ask about Dubrovnik as well because we went there. Um, we actually travelled by train. I, I went with my girlfriend, and we took the train uh, down via Paris, of course, sleeper from. Munich was it, and then to Zagreb, and then again worked their way down the coast. We noticed that responsible travel off of trips to Dubrovnik, and when we got there, we saw this big red sign saying "Respect the city" and a campaign by UNESCO. And we sat down with the mayor there, and he talked us through it. Um, how do you sell package holidays to Dubrovnik and avoid adding to these overcrowding issues? A really good question. I mean. 
the first thing is, I mean, our, our trips to Dubrovnik are not soulless Dubrovnik, so they will include uh, travel out into the wider area, more natural and cultural tourism. So we wouldn't just sell Dubrovnik on its own. So what we're what we're trying to do is, because many people, it's a remarkable place. You know, they they want to see that, but we're trying to spread the benefits of tourism a little bit more widely as well. Um, you know, for me, a, a couple of tips about visiting over tourism places. Um, firstly, stay in a hotel, preferably a locally owned hotel, rather than a than a flat or a home sharing place. Why is that? Um, because the many of the uh, flats and houses that were there originally for local people to rent or to aspire to buy have been taken out of the housing market and provided for the tourism industry. That's not good if you're young and growing up in Dubrovnik. So stay in a hotel would be my number one thing because um, that's more regulated and, and, and more licensed. Um, second thing, hire a local guide. You know, why do I say that? Because the local guide knows what time the cruise ships come in. They figured it out. They know the best view um, where you can avoid the crowds. They know the restaurants, which actually you might feel a little bit uncomfortable if you went in because it's really a local's place. But equally, they know the place which is going to suit you really, really well. And of course, it creates a job and income for them as well. So a local guide will help you see the sites away from, away from all the other tourists, um, help you minimize any unintended consequences which you might not be aware of, um, and lastly, creates a job and, and creates employment. So those, those two things would be my tips. What are the best ways to eco-travel on the cheap? Um, well, you know, so I think traveling responsibly can be super cheap. You know, for example, some of our most popular holidays in Cuba um, are homestays. The community has set aside a room, not a room they're using for their families, but a room that they can make available um, for tourists. It's cheap staying in a homestay. It's incredible because you get to speak the language, you learn a bit about the cook the food in the evening, uh, a little bit of music. So homestays are unbelievable. It comes back to my idea of the local guide. A local guide doesn't cost much. But you know, really, you will see more and experience more with a local guide than you ever would stumbling around on your own with your guidebook or your app. You will discover more you know, from that person. Eat in local restaurants. Eat locals. Eat what local people do. Well, why? Because I want to discover. I don't want to eat pizza, um, you know, unless I'm in Italy or, or Napoli. But um, I don't want to eat pizza. I want to eat what the locals do. I want, I want to learn something. So eat local, stay local, local guides. Travel by public transport. I mean, some of my best ever encounters with local people have been when the chicken's been passed to me on the bus, uh, or the goats come over the top, or I've had to look after a baby for a while. It's low carbon, but what a way to meet local people. It's, it's funny, because you seem to be, uh, I don't know whether you've looked at some of the rushes we've shot, but we actually stayed at an agritourism in Italy, uh, mm. in, in Alba Bello, very close. Mm. And we had that lovely, uh, familial experience, of course, you know, Pierangelo would come, you know, the old grandfather would show us around his farm, and yeah. it was lovely, we'd sit down at the dining table with the yeah. mama, and she came in with the, with the, with the bread, it was, it was it a expensive. prop, authentic experience. It wasn't expensive, was it? No, oh, we, we paid, what was it, like 40 euros for the night, with, it, with nice kind of classic Alba Bella, you know, a nice yeah. dome, um, what were they called, the little, do you remember? Trullo. Trullo. Yeah, there is this idea that organic food, well, organic food is more expensive. So that anything green is more expensive, therefore responsible tourism is more expensive. Myth. It's not. It doesn't have to be. What role can a big global organisation like the UN and specifically UNESCO with regard to travel play in greening the industry? Potentially a huge one. Um, we, um, we don't have many truly global organisations in tourism. Um, UNESCO is one of the few. What it does is, is acknowledge and recognize some of the most important and vulnerable places on earth, cultural, natural, cultural, and, and, and natural. Um, it puts a focus on them. It puts attention on them. It puts eyes. It puts journalists' minds on them. It puts governments' minds on them. Um, but there's a dilemma. And the dilemma is it also is a very effective form of marketing. And it attracts large numbers of tourists, which I think they recognize. You know, but the onus now is much more on how we manage tourism, manage tourism more sustainably. Um, and so if UNESCO can develop some thinking and share some thinking about that, which can be uh, replicated, not, not 
identically because every place is different, but can replicate across each of those destinations uh, where the sites are situated. You're starting to develop a framework for how to think and act about managing tourism more sustainably. And of course, if you do it in a, in a UNESCO site, you can take the same thinking and the same ideas and you can use that elsewhere in your destination. So I think the onus now is, is, is firmly on managing tourism um, and I think dealing with the consequence of labelling. It, it's, it's important to list and label, you can't get away from that, but there's a consequence to it and that's what needs to be um, to delivered. And I also think um, you know, the, kind of, the idea of warnings, um, you're not managing this well enough. There is a risk to you. Um, you may potentially lose your, your status. I think that's one of the few levers we've got, the few levers we've got to really push destinations to get to grips with it. So I, I, I see it as a powerful influence. What do you think of UNESCO's Green Weekend series? Oh, I love it. I know, I love it. I mean, genuinely, I love we'll it. put it on a billboard. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I love it because um, I wanted to go, you know, and um, it made me want to go. It made me realise that um, you presented responsible tourism in a very simple, relatable, more enjoyable form of, of, of travel. And we need to debunk, you know, the kind of it sounds hard, it sounds complicated, I don't know if I can do this, I might get it wrong. And you did that beautifully, I think. One of the things I think about the world uh, you know, right now is we have, um, it seems to me, an increasing fear of, of strangers, whether that be people of different races, religions, colours, sexual preferences. You know, it, um, it feels to me that the tensions are, are, rise, are, are rising in that area. I don't like that. Tourism, is the great joiner together. You know, it's, it's the great way to meet people, to share experiences, hopefully to both benefit from that. So aside from the sustainability question, which is, we've talked about and is vital, I just want to talk about humans and sharing things, understanding each other, living more sustainably on the planet, and getting along a little bit better. And tourism, more than any other industry on Earth, any other industry on Earth, does that.